France, a nation destined by excellence and empire to create some of the greatest feats of engineering the world has ever seen. France was led by rulers who compared themselves to gods and who waged bloody warfare across the continent. Their quest for perfection drove this nation to build on an unimaginable scale. Notre Dame is a structure of breathtaking innovation. But their wretched extravagance led to revolution, bringing the empire to the brink of ruin. From the chaos emerged a conqueror for the ages. Napoleon was a force of nature. His single-minded goal, empire on the scale of Rome. In 1163, Paris, an army of construction workers pulling endless loads of limestone swarm over the Ile de la Cité, an island in the middle of the River Seine. The site has been sacred for thousands of years. It was first a Druid shrine. That was transformed into a Roman temple for the god Jupiter and later became a destination for Christian pilgrims honoring St. Denis, who was tortured here and beheaded. Now, the King of France has ordered a new grand cathedral that will be the envy of all of Europe. That king was Louis VII. The cathedral is Notre Dame. To this day, among the most magnificent ever built, Allons enfants de le petit, le jour de gloire est arrivé. The day of glory has arrived. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. I learned the Marseillaise, perhaps the world's most passionate national anthem, about 15 years ago when I decided to take some time off and come here to the streets of Paris and retrace the steps of the French Revolution. But the immediate legacy of the French Revolution was by no means days of glory. It was a reign of reactionary terror that left France in political chaos with headless corpses and eventually brought on Napoleon. Democracy was to come later. But just as the foundations of democracy are bathed in blood, so are they also bathed in beauty. And the glory and beauty of France endure in its invention, innovation, in the arts and sciences, in its civil planning and architecture, and in its incomparable facility to build like a cathedral. The word cathedral does not just infer some big old church, generically. It's taken from the word cathedra, meaning seat. It is the seat of the bishop or the archbishop, the pope's representative in a particular parish or district. This is the Cathedral of Paris, Notre Dame de Paris, Our Lady of Paris dedicated to the Virgin Mary. It ain't bad, is it? Matter of fact, it's probably the world's most famous church. Now before this, in the early Middle Ages, churches were built in a style called Romanesque, using elements of real ancient Rome, like columns and capitals. Romanesque churches were short and fat and squatty with big thick walls, little bitty windows, barrel vaults, rounded arches. Even the Romanesque sculpture was austere and solid, but the churches didn't hold a lot of folks. And the Bishop of Paris, Maurice de Soli, not only wanted a church that would fill up with thousands, he wanted a church that would inspire awe. De Soli was regarded as a Christian icon in France. After years of bloody fighting, he and Louis VII wanted to consolidate their control over the feudal lands of France. Their great cathedral would be the cornerstone of that new regime and a symbol of their awesome authority. It would be built in a way never before seen on Earth. Maurice was uh, the bishop uh, of Paris at a moment when uh, Paris really was a boom town. 
uh, Louis the Seventh uh, established Paris definitively as the capital uh, of the Kingdom of France. I think Maurice wanted to, to build a building that was worthy of the status of the city and men of enormous wealth and power. For two centuries, from the 1100s to the 1300s, that it took to build Notre Dame from soup to nuts is a period we call Gothic. But originally, Gothic was a disparaging term. Isn't that always the way when the next generations don't like anything that came before? Gothic falsely meant of the Goths or barbaric. But Gothic is majestic with tall decorative spires and thin lancet windows and round rose windows and stained glass and huge massive piers inside, wide naves. When you think Gothic, think vertical. The Gothic, one of its primary characteristics is the sense of uh, both spaciousness uh, and scale uh, and uh, extreme lightness, both structural lightness and then uh, an interior filled uh, with light filtering in through the stained glass windows. It presented a, a kind of new vision or new image of, of, of heaven um, to, to the worshiper. Notre Dame would be the length of a football field with walls towering 100 feet into the air, so big that it would engulf de Sully's old church, which continued to hold services during the early years of Notre Dame's construction. Scaffolding provided a framework for lifting heavy equipment and materials, wooden braces, and stonework for constructing the vaults. An ingenious man-powered wheel crane mounted at the top of the scaffolding, was used to lift the heaviest material. A man or two would have gotten in the wheel and uh, essentially like a hamster hoisted the materials up. To build the cathedral, thousands of workers would spend their entire lives erecting these walls. Each mason seems to have had a mark uh, which he would carve into the blocks so that uh, they would get paid uh, by the piece. One often has the romantic notion that uh, each stone was a kind of carved prayer, uh, but uh, it was much more uh, uh, practical than that. Uh, if there was no money, there was no work. So many thousands of tons of stone were needed that it started a craze called the Cult of Carts, wherein men, noblemen, and commoners would hook themselves to ox carts and pull the stones seeking absolution along the way. Now, as opposed to Rome and the Renaissance and even now, where architecture is deductive, that means it's thought out on paper according to mathematical proportions, Gothic architecture was additive. Some of these churches were just drawn in the dirt and then they went up. It's not to say that they didn't have a plan, but if they made a mistake, they added a pier or a wall or a pointed arch. Now, the thing with Notre Dame is that the weight of these stones, the downforce was so incredible. They also had the added problem of the wind because they were building up. Subsequently, they invoked this fantastic engineering element called the flying buttress. The flying buttress is this sort of half arch which displaces the weight out and then down. Notre Dame was so magnificent that it started a craze of Gothic building throughout Northern Europe, even before it was half finished. In the past, Builders with soaring ambitions had always been stymied by gravity. The crushing weight of a stone ceiling created too much outward stress on the walls. It may have even started out as an ingenious type of scaffolding to support the walls. But now, as architects scrawled out brilliant blueprints in the shadows of the rising structure, the solution of the flying buttress would become a design element for the ages. With this support, load-bearing walls could contain large cutouts for majestic windows that previously were impossible. The walls would have been too weak. By 1190, the south and north nave walls and lower vaults were erected. The western towers were also underway, rising independently to the height of the great western rose window, perhaps the most famous stained glass in the world. 
By 1196, in failing health, Dessouli was determined to make Notre Dame Europe's most extraordinary cathedral, even if he wouldn't be around to see it. Uh, Maurice de Sully, in his will, uh, left money for uh, the roof uh, of the cathedral. And through his generosity, it left his mark uh, on uh, his beloved church. The Cathedral of Notre Dame was finally completed in the mid-14th century, nearly 200 years after construction began. It was the symbol of an empire on the rise. Its grandeur and beauty was a harbinger of the power and glory to come. But first, the empire would be rocked to its foundations by a ruler who compared himself to a god, who encircled France in spectacular fortifications and constructed the largest palace the world has ever seen. The Neo-Gothic National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. has a piece of moon rock from Apollo 11 set into its southern stained glass window. 1648, France has a new ruling family, the House of Bourbon. The country has just emerged from centuries of bloody warfare and devastating bouts with the plague. The new king is just nine years old. His name is Louis XIV. Louis begins his reign at a time when the nobles who had lost their bid for power won't let bygones be bygones. And with a young boy in control, they spy an opportunity. The nobles revolt, forcing young Louis and his family to flee into hiding. But the royal family regains control. And Louis vows he will never let anyone challenge his authority again. As the boy grew into a young man, his famous taste for the extravagant grew too, especially his massive construction projects. Unlike Notre Dame, a testament to God, Louis was determined to build a monument to himself. In a radical break with past kings, Louis takes absolute control by moving the seat of government out of Paris and setting it down in a small town 13 miles south called Versailles. In 1661, Architects began work on a colossal complex that would be the nerve center of the empire. Louis XIV wanted spectacular achievements. He wanted spectacular engineering, spectacular architecture. Versailles itself is a statement uh, that says a lot about the kind of uh, image he wanted to project to the world. You know, he wanted to be number one power. Versailles. It was here that the powdered wig and puff pastry were raised to high art. 700 rooms, 2,000 windows, 1,250 fireplaces, 1,800 acres of gardens, 1,400 working fountains. And not only did Louis call these magnificent digs home, he also called them office. Because if you're the king, you don't go to work. Work comes to you. After all, this is the dude who said, la tasse c'est moi. The state is me. And what better place to be the state than in a pad that's got an entire hallway made out of mirrors? Let me put it this way. If you were called on the carpet Versailles, it was a pretty long carpet. By 1682, when Versailles was finished, it would have become the symbol of the power and the glory of the regime ancien. His gardens and fountains were the most beautiful the world had ever seen. But they needed one thing, water. To solve this problem, Louis commissioned probably his most extraordinary feat of engineering, the Marley Machine, an enormous pumping station to bring water from the Seine three miles upstream to his beloved fountains here. Inaugurated by Louis in 1684, the Marley Machine was a miracle of hydraulic engineering. It was powered by the current of the Seine 
flowing through 14 gigantic water wheels capable of supplying 100 million gallons of water a day. In his mind, Louis now transcended mere mortality. He identified himself with Apollo, the Greek god of the sun, and adopted a new name, the Sun King. While Louis XIV was securing absolute power at home, he set his sights on the rest of Europe. Louis XIV was an aggressor in a, in a, in a Europe that France was already the leading power. To achieve his dreams of empire, the French monarch turned to one of the world's greatest military engineers, Sebastien de Vauban. Vauban showed his brilliance in the battlefield with a revolutionary strategy of attack, the parallel trench method. It would save lives and change the way wars were fought for hundreds of years. 1673, Vauban would put his parallel method of attack to the ultimate test, under gunfire at the siege of the Dutch fortress at Maastricht. Vauban stationed Louis' troops along a first trench running parallel to the fort and 600 yards away, out of cannon range. The parallel trenches moved forward until Louis' artillery was near enough to fire breaches in the walls of the enemy fort. His technique worked perfectly. The French troops swarmed through the breaches, overwhelming the Dutch defenders. Vauban's new trench warfare led to victory after victory and allowed Louis to travel to the front lines, hazardous duty for earlier kings. Vauban offered him the possibility to be the winner at the war. The most beautiful attack of Vauban was the one where the king is here. Every spring, Louis would lead his army to besiege border towns, taking much of the court with him, including his queen and mistress. Vauban's siege tactics helped Louis expand the borders of France. His defensive genius Building and renovating 300 forts around the country virtually sealed France off from attack. In ancient Rome, the geometrical shape that was considered most divine for building was the circle or the square for its precision and symmetry. We call this today the centralized plan. Now, this centralized plan became the inspiration for Vauban to build a fort, except in the shape of a star. But the real genius of Vauban was that he could adapt these forts to any terrain. He could read the valleys and the rivers and the cliffs and build his trenches and moats and walls to maximum effectiveness. He could eliminate blind spots where offenders could hide, at the same time giving the defenders the best vantage points in which to return fire. What Vauban gave to the Kingdom of France is the fact that uh, during 150 years after him, never the war become inside the, country, the territory of France. The war was, was always outside. That's very good for the king. But Louis' unchecked spending on hundreds of forts left the country on the verge of bankruptcy. Vauban offered the king a simple solution, tax the nobles, not just the peasants. His treatise was rejected but the idea would come up again 100 years later in revolution. But for now, Louis XIV was the most powerful monarch on earth. With his European expansion underway, he would set out to dominate the seas with a passage from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, a passage no one believed could ever be built. The First World War officially ended in 1919, 
when Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles in the Hall of Mirrors. Louis XIV tamed nature just like he did empires. He pulled these parks and gardens of Versailles right out of a marsh. He spared no expense in diverting the rivers around Versailles to fill up these 1,400 fountains. But while these fountains were being designed, there was a salt tax collector named Pierre Paul Riquet who had water dreams of his own. He dreamed of connecting the Mediterranean Sea with the North Atlantic Ocean with a waterway that would cut all the way through France. The influence of France during the reign of Louis XIV was so profound that French became the spoken language amongst the educated of Europe, as well as the language of diplomacy amongst all the European monarchies. But Louis XIV detested dependency upon these monarchies, particularly Spain, for its access from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, this tax collector with a dream, Pierre Paul Riquet, was going to fix that little problem for Louis with the Canal du Midi that would not only connect the Mediterranean Sea to the North Atlantic, but would pave the way for the 19th century industrial revolution when to have a canal would be an absolute must for any country that wanted to make money. Pierre Paul Riquet was a young boy when he first heard about the idea of a canal through France that would allow ships to bypass the long sea voyage around Spain. He dreamed about it all his life. I doubt whether Riquet was very easy to live with because he was so uh, caught up with this project. He was so, I think it's fair to say, he was obsessed by it. Something in him made him want to build, made him want to achieve something concrete that would go down uh, uh, for posterity. 1662. At age 52, after amassing a private fortune in the lucrative business of collecting taxes for the king, Riquet was ready to step out of his comfortable retirement and step into engineering history. With an ingenious solution to one of the most vexing architectural problems of the century, how to keep the canal filled with water. Riquet discovered a series of rivers that could be channeled to feed the canal at its highest point. But he'd need to control the water flow year round. It was going to be dry during the summer. So Riquet understood you needed to get a big volume of water uh, as a reservoir. And uh, the, the site was found, which was the saint ferriol Dam. And that was absolutely spectacular. That was the key to the whole project. A reservoir. It was a stroke of genius. Riquet had solved the dilemma that no one could before him. There was just one small problem. To supply the canal with enough water, he would have to build the largest dam the world had ever seen. It would stand 105 feet tall and have a thickness of more than 450 feet. Behind it, a two billion gallon artificial lake. The Bassin de saint Ferriol would collect water from several sources. It may have looked good on paper, but there was only one man in the world with enough money to foot the bill for Riquet's bold project. To get to the king, Riquet had to find a way to his all-powerful finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He sketched out his blueprints and presented them to Colbert. Colbert instantly recognized its potential to provide revenue and fatten the nation's coffers. The next step was to convince the king, who liked the idea. The canal would be a grand project worthy of his reign. Louis XIV acutely realized the potential of architecture uh, to establish an image that would embody not only his personal uh, authority and status, but also that uh, of, uh, of the kingdom of France that he ruled. Even so, Riquet had to stake his own savings to pay for one third of the project before Louis would give his approval. In 1666, without any background in engineering, Riquet threw himself into the daring task of building his massive canal. He began construction of the saint Ferriol Reservoir, which would take four years to build. 
while work on the reservoir and feeder system was underway, the first stones were laid for the canal itself in Toulouse on November 17, 1667. By January 1668, 2,000 laborers were already at work. At the peak of construction of the canal, Riquet had a labor force of 12,000, including 600 women due to a shortage of manpower. To ensure a large and reliable workforce, he paid well above the going rate, provided affordable housing, and even gave vacation and sick days. He introduced uh, an early form of social security. You know, there was such a thing as paid leave, which was absolutely unheard of at that time. So he was well ahead of his times, but he had to be to be able to implement the project in a decent time. It wasn't long before Riquet's massive engineering project and generous labor policies began to draw criticism. Opponents of the canal accused Riquet of wasting public money for his own glory on a project that was doomed to fail. Even Colbert began to have doubts. In 1677, 10 years into construction, the project reached a crisis as the canal approached the southern slope of the Enserune Ridge. Riquet proposed a daring new idea. He would build the world's first tunnel for navigation, and he would do it with explosives. When word of Riquet's plan reached Paris, Colbert panicked. He ordered all work on the canal stopped until a panel of experts could investigate. Thumbs up, and Riquet's lifelong dream would be realized. Thumbs down, and decades of hard work would go down the drain, and Riquet's fortune would be wiped out. The guillotine was promoted by Dr. Guillotin, but built by Tobias Schmidt, a German harpsichord maker. Sixteen seventy-seven, the Canal du Midi in the south of France. One of the greatest engineering feats in history is on the brink of disaster. After ten years of tireless effort, Pierre Paul Riquet risked losing everything. When word reached Paris that Riquet planned to tunnel through a ridge of mountains, Minister of Finance Jean-Baptiste Colbert ordered all work stopped pending an investigation into what he thought was an impossible idea. Using explosives to build the world's first navigable tunnel for a canal. Riquet's life work and personal fortune hung in the balance. Colbert said, we just don't believe you're going to uh, succeed in this. And so Riquet, the story is that uh, he increased the numbers of uh, men and women working on the, on, on the job, and that by the time the inspector came, I think it was two weeks later, they'd been able to, 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 to get cut through and provide proof that the, the tunnel was feasible. For 15 years, Riquet had faced every conceivable obstacle, natural and man-made, to build his beloved canal but now, at 76, he was exhausted. On October the 1st of 1680, Riquet, gravely ill, called his son to his bedside and asked, Où est le canal? Where is the canal? His son responded that it was only about three miles away from the sea. Riquet passed away. The canal was opened eight months later, eight months too late for his creator to see it. On May 15, 1681, the Canal du Midi opened for business. Canal du Midi is a masterpiece. The solution for um, transport by water in France is the best solution still today. And uh, the Canal du Midi shows the way. The Canal du Midi was only one of dozens of projects Louis XIV built in his lust for power and glory. 
But by the end of his reign, his profligate spending brought France to the brink of ruin. His autocratic rule and huge debts would sow the seeds of revolt a century later. In 1789, the monarchy was deposed by the French Revolution. King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had their heads cut off in the Place du Roi. But the reign of terror would turn in on itself, and Danton and Robespierre and the other fathers of the French Revolution would either be murdered in their bathtub or die by the guillotine themselves. And out of this chaos would come a young, brilliant general from Corsica who would lead France into a new era of empire. 1795, a young officer from a small Mediterranean island is about to make his first bid to seize power. Paris is reeling from three years of bloody turmoil in the wake of the French Revolution. His reign would capture the imagination of the French people and launch him onto the world stage as one of the greatest conquerors in history. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was a force of nature. Audacity was his middle name. Napoleon imposed himself upon Europe with such force that he goes down in the annals with Caesar and few others. Napoleon's rise was lightning fast. From the head of the Army of the Interior to Commander-in-Chief of the forces in Italy in just one year. In 1796, Austria attacked French troops in Italy, and Napoleon took a disaffected and undernourished army and turned it into a veritable force. He beat Austria in battle after battle, eating up most of northern Italy, finally even bringing that serene Republic of Venice to its knees. When Napoleon returned to Paris, he was a star, and then he started to take over. But believe me, after 10 years of the blood and guts of the French Revolution, the people of Paris and France were ready to say, praise the Lord. In 1804, Napoleon was crowned emperor at Notre Dame. It is said there's a preparatory drawing of Jacques-Louis David of the event where Napoleon's taking the crown from the pope and crowning himself. He also turned to his brother and said, if daddy could only see us now. Now, with his astounding ego, it's interesting that Napoleon was averse to creating monuments to himself, but he created one, 70,000 tons of stone in the shape of an arch, model on the Arch of Titus in the form of Rome. It would be called the Arc de Triomphe. In 1809, Napoleon chose architect Francois Chalgrin's design for his triumphal arch. For a site, Napoleon decided on the end of the Avenue de Champs-Élysées in the Place de l'Étoile. The structure would consist of a simple arch with a vaulted passageway, 98 feet high and 49 feet wide. In all, 164 feet high, and 148 feet wide. The arch would be twice as big as its inspiration in Rome. At the base of the arch's pillars are four huge relief sculptures commemorating the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. The view of that grand arch, standing majestically like a crown atop the most celebrated street in Paris, had power and glory written all over it. Napoleon was a self-made man, and that's in many ways what much of the revolution stood for, was that kind of brash individualism which took people's breath away. By 1812, Napoleon had conquered most of Europe, but then the boy bit off more than he could chew. He invaded Russia, and the rest, as we say, is history. Poor supply trains, harsh winters, the resiliency of the Russian people, Napoleon was defeated, forced to abdicate, and exiled to the island of Elba. But he escaped and enjoyed a short reprise to power we call the 100 Days, before he was defeated at Waterloo and exiled again, this time to St. Helena, and for good.
Perhaps in respect and awe that the French felt for Napoleon, they continued the work on the Arc de Triomphe until it was finished in 1836. And the Arc de Triomphe would stand as the emblem of France until a wiry, bizarre skeleton of a building made out of iron would change the idea of an urban skyline forever. The Arc de Triomphe would tower over Paris for another 50 years before succumbing to a spire that would seize the imagination of the world. In 1889, Paris would build itself one of the most memorable and daring monuments on Earth, the Eiffel Tower. Napoleon was not short. At five feet, six and a half inches, he was even slightly taller than the average Frenchman of the 19th century. In the years after Napoleon's defeat, France survived three bloody revolutions in its turbulent move away from kings and emperors toward democracy. The 1880s marked the zenith of the French Empire, a colonial superpower covering one-third of Africa, Indochina, and a wide swath of the Caribbean. The International Exhibition of Paris of 1889 was designed to celebrate the centennial of the revolution and establish a new era of power and glory for France. The French government chose a grand centerpiece for the Expo, an epic thousand-foot tower, a bold symbol of optimism and self-confidence. The Minister of Commerce, Edouard Lacroix, saw it as a symbol of progress where he said humanity gravitates endlessly upward. A design competition considered 100 proposals, including one from the engineering firm of Gustav Eiffel. Since the 1830s, engineers had been trying to build such a tower without success. Eiffel's international reputation as a superb builder of enormous bridges and megastructures and his elegant design for the tower made him the easy winner. But Eiffel's tower didn't please everyone. As soon as his design plans were made public, there was an enormous outcry from Parisian artists and intellectuals. It was claimed that it was ugly, it was industrial, it was useless. It was a travesty to the Parisian landscape, which contained all sorts of wonderful classical structures. Today, we take the Eiffel Tower for granted, but if you think about it in its time, this thing was pretty bizarre. Gustav Eiffel was about to transform the concept and appearance not only of a civil structure, but an entire city skyline. This thing was going to be the forerunner of the skyscraper, and a lot of folks in Paris didn't dig it. Just like 100 years later, they didn't particularly like the pyramid from I.M. Pei in front of the Louvre. But with the Eiffel Tower, it wasn't just the city do-gooders, but serious architects and writers voraciously lobbied against it. Guy de Maupassant supposedly said, I'll eat there because it's the only place in Paris where I don't have to look at the thing. The tower would be 985 feet tall, the tallest man-made structure in the world. In January 1887, Eiffel broke ground at the Champ de Mars on the left bank of the Seine and hit his first problem soil samples for the site of the two piers along the river were wet and soft, a serious obstacle for a 7,000-ton tower. Eiffel's solution? An innovative approach to anchoring his massive tower. For the riverside foundations, he sunk airtight iron chambers, or caissons, so workers could excavate below the water level right down to a solid rock footing. The foundations were set on the diagonal, so the tower's four massive columns would exert their thrust at right angles to the foundation blocks. Eiffel displayed his genius for innovation in his design for the cylindrical shoes that hold the columns. 
in each, he placed a hydraulic piston so he could align the columns precisely once they were erected. Eiffel now faced the single greatest challenge of all, wind. His solution would chart the course for all future skyscraper technology. The biggest names of 20th century architecture would all follow in his footsteps. Eiffel was a leading authority in the aerodynamics of high frames, but even he was building into the unknown. Eiffel utilized a series of lattice trust piers, precisely calculated with in-curving edges to mitigate the effects of wind. He designed the tower so that it would never sway more than four to five inches in the strongest wind. On July 1st, 1887, the tower began to rise. Huge pieces of the iron structure were hoisted into place by steam-powered cranes. Two-thirds of their rivets were inserted in the shops to allow quick assembly on the site. Now, one of the ways in which Eiffel did things rapidly was to prefabricate parts. He was a master at organizing his projects. Eiffel's streamlined construction paid off. In contrast to the decades it took to construct earlier large monuments, or nearly two centuries to build Notre Dame, Eiffel's tower was completed in only 22 months with just 300 iron workers. When it was completed in 1889, Gustav Eiffel's masterpiece replaced the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt as the tallest structure in the world, a record it retained until 1930 when it was surpassed by New York City's Chrysler Building. What's wonderful about the Eiffel Tower is that it so horrified the French for the first few years after it was built. It reflected French technological modernity, architectural uh, audacity that did not lay well with some of the traditional elites. And today, it's now regarded as simply beautiful. On June the 21st, 1889, the Eiffel Tower was open to the world. Gustave Eiffel conducted personally guided tours for many celebrities and royals, including Buffalo Bill, the Shah of Persia, the King of Siam, the Prince of Wales, even Thomas Edison. Young women bought dresses called Eiffel climbers. The tower was the hit of the exposition, attracting almost two million people. Gustave Eiffel had financed almost 80% of the tower in exchange for the proceeds from all the concessions. He got his money back within a year, and the tower eventually made him a very rich man. The Eiffel Tower symbolized an ideal Republican society, that is the towers made up of many small pieces that interconnect and mutually support each other, all people from all walks of life mutually supporting each other in a democratic government, holding up the Republic and moving it forward. In spite of the cranky cab drivers of Paris, I love this town and I love France. And then again, cab drivers are cranky anywhere. If I could go back in time, a few things at the top of my wish list would be to hang out for a weekend at Versailles with Louis XIV, or sip a coffee with one of my own personal heroes, Victor Hugo, or watch Cezanne paint or Rodin sculpt. As it is, I'm quite content to take my coffee looking up at Notre Dame or staring at the stained glass of Chart Cathedral or gazing up at the Eiffel Tower and wondering how in the heck did they get only 11 pounds per square inch at the greatest points of stress on that thing. The grace and the style and the sophistication of the French have persisted from Charlemagne right into the 21st century. How do they do it? Well, some say it's arrogance. Personally, I think it's confidence. Vive la France. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller.